Before this video begins, I want to thank Jesse Trivels for his help and guidance for this video. We talked on Twitter a little bit ago and his advice actually helped me out a lot. Make sure you check out his channel. He has a tons of video essays just like this one. And I actually got inspired for one of them, uh, the one he has on The Office. Personally, my favorite one. Uh, so thank you and let's get right into today's video. TV couples are nothing new to the world of the silver screen. They add a personal and somewhat realistic interpretation of how romantic relationships develop in real life. Humans are social creatures, and we often draw towards people that remind us of ourselves, the people that we love, and what we like. Watching something like a romantic relationship go on screen is always attractive for those and for many other reasons. Throughout the years, there have been multiple number of couples that have become somewhat iconic in their respective time of airing. You got your Ross and Rachel from Friends. Chuck and Blair from Gossip Girl. Just because you're dressed poorly doesn't mean you're not Chuck Bass. Why would I want to be him? And Ted and Bush, I, I mean, Ted and Robin from How I Met Your Mother. And that goes without mentioning old school couples that were pretty much popular back in the day. It's fun to watch these and other couples go through the journey of meeting, becoming friends, falling in love, breaking each other's hearts once or twice only to realize that they really love each other and live happily ever after. It is easy to relate to the major aspects of these relationships. The individual who for some divine incredible impossible circumstance finds the one and then tries his or her hardest to love and stay with that person no matter the struggle. And when you love someone you just, you, you don't stop. This is the type of love that most, if not all people, long for. A love that transcends time and hardships. However, no matter how popular and in some occasions idealistic these relationships may seem, they all have one major flaw. They're not relatable to the audience. In fact, I dare say that they're not very relatable at all. Or at least, not in a realistic way. Ross and Rachel are your one-dimensional on and off relationship. Two individuals who are written in a way that no matter what each of them do in their individual lives, they are incredibly and toxically depending on each other. Ross can be with anyone else since that would ruin his chance of getting back with Rachel regardless of how horrible she's treated him in the past, which often brings up the worst of him. And Rachel is unable to let go of Ross no matter how good other men treat her and even taking into account the fact that Ross got himself involved with a lady within the first day of breaking up. Although, you know. <laughs> we were Ted is an obsessive sociopath who during 8th season was utterly and completely traumatized with Robin, to the point that he was going to ruin his best friend's wedding for the sake of his own happiness. He had several opportunities to move on with his life with partners that were much more compatible than Robin, but he refuses in multiple occasions without really considering what he does to other people. There's no top 5 Robin, there's just a top 1 and it's you. And Chuck and Blair, well, Chuck and Blair are Chuck and Blair, not much to say there really. Don't get me wrong, I like those shows a lot too. Matter of fact, I like How I Met Your Mother so much that I believe I watched it around 8 times. It's fun and amusing, yes, but not realistic, and therefore not something that I can feel is talking directly to me. And then you have Jim and Pam, or what I like to call the perfect archetype of a TV couple. The Office is a pretty great show. It's an American sitcom in a mockumentary style with very cartoonish and somehow relatable characters. They are led by regional manager Michael Scott, the physical manifestation of a man-child with a heart of gold that works as a manager for a debatably failing paper company. The cast plays a wide range of characters, all of them interpreted in a perfect balance between the line of realistic and dumb exaggerated behavior, or at least in the very first few seasons. It's a very good show. So good in fact that, as of December 2018, it became the most popular and watched show on Netflix, almost doubling the amount of views and watch time of the second place, which back then was, ironically, Friends. But why? It's up for debate who the actual main characters of the show are. Depending on who you ask, some men say the entire office. Two, three. 
Still some people not jumping. You gotta be kidding me. Who isn't jumping? Okay. I'll tell you who. Guys. Daryl, Phyllis, Stanley, Angela, and Oscar. I am jumping. You I'm are? Jump yes, Let I'm me see jumping. you jump. Oh my god. Some say the sales department and Michael. As I was saying, right now yeah, we are having. Talk louder. Okay. Our prices have never been lower. Son, you have Certainly. to talk louder. Never been lower. Louder, I son! But liquor! Our prices have Please never stop. been lower! Stop it. Heat! That is totally inappropriate. You never yell at the client. Or some even say that it's just Michael. I have a great one. Little kid lover. That way people will know exactly where my priorities are at. Based on appearances in the show, we can conclude that the main cast were Michael Scott, Dwight Schrute, Jim Halpert, and Pam Beasley. Michael did not miss a single episode in his seven seasons, Dwight did not miss a single episode during the nine seasons of the show, Jim only missed one episode, and Pam only missed three without counting the ones in season eight where Fisher, the actress that plays Pam, was on maternity leave. It also makes sense as the entire run of The Office is pretty much driven by these four characters and the goal that each of them pursues. Michael is a guy who's desperate for attention and for a family, and his whole character arc is based on his need to be liked and treat his subordinates as his family. Dwight is an incredible salesman who seeks nothing more than attaining the regional manager position. However, these two characters are often played in a very cartoonish and humorous way, which makes sense since this still sitcom and making people laugh is still a main goal. Lazy Scranton, the electric city. They call it that because of the electricity. But then you have Jim and Pam two individuals who by all means and purposes are regular everyday people. Sure, they have their comedic moments such as when Pam jokes with Michael. Every time Michael's in a meeting, he makes me come in and give him a post-it note telling him who's on the phone. I did it once and he freaked out. He loved it so much. The thing is, he doesn't get that many calls. Or when Jim pranks Dwight. Fact. Bears eat beets. Oh. Bears beats Battlestar Galactica. Bears do not... What is going on? What are you doing? Last week, I was in a drugstore and I saw these glasses. Uh, $4. But these instances are only as a result of them interacting with other characters. Take that aside and you have a very likable and funny guy who is just trying to move on from a boring job. This is my biggest sale of the year. They love me over there for some reason. I'm not really sure why, but uh, you know, I make one call over there every year just to renew their account. And that one call ends up being 25% uh, of my commission. For the whole year. And a girl who never dated anyone other than her high school sweetheart that has dreams and aspirations but it is too afraid to follow them. Oh, excuse me. I'm fine with my choices. Uh, you are? Yeah. It's impractical. I'm not gonna try to get a house like that. Um, they don't even make houses like that in Scranton. So I'm never gonna It is incredibly realistic for that matter. No one has a boss like Michael. Sometimes I'll start a sentence and I don't even know where it's going. I just hope I find it along the way. Like an improv conversation. An improvisation. Or a coworker like Dwight. Whenever I'm about to do something, I think, would an idiot do that? And if they would, I do not do that thing. We all know someone like Jim or Pam. And in many cases, we are like Jim and Pam. Individuals who are trying to make the best out of a boring job and an average life, but that sometimes are too afraid to take any risks. In fact, I will argue that the real main characters of the show are these two, as a medium by which the audience feels identified and recognized by. Jim and Pam's goal is the common goal of an everyday person. To be successful in your career, marry the one you love, and raise a loving family with that person, and live a happy and stable life. However, here's where it gets interesting. You see, Jim and Pam meet under very common and relatable circumstances. They meet, become friends, and fall in love at work. I had plans to meet a friend tonight, which I had to cancel. But this is cool too. I'm not a complainer. How important this is, you may ask? Well, according to HR Review, around 30% of all romantic relationships start at work. The average individual will spend one third of his or her life at work making it the one place where we spend most of our lives and the people that we meet there are the ones that we see and interact with the most. And the more you see someone, the more you start to like them. This can be friendship-wise or romantic-wise. This is known as the mere exposure effect or the familiarity principle. And it can happen at a number of places, not just work. If you are for any reason jobless at the moment, you probably also have the one place that you frequent the most. It can be school. 
You cannot learn from books. A community of some sort, a class, or even places like the gym. You're getting a good workout. Can I feel your pulse? <sighs> no, I'm good, thanks. Really? Hey, uh, uh, young man, can you wipe down that seat? Get out of my way. No matter what stage of your life you're on, you always have a place where most of your time is spent on, and the people there are the ones that you familiarize yourself with the most. I could even bet that among those people, you probably have someone who you at least consider attractive or who you feel like you're the most compatible with. This is where the office plays the relatable card the hardest, at least in my opinion. They manage to find a way into the audience's mind by reminding them of that ray of light that we find at places like a job or a school. You might not be particularly keen to say place, you may even hate it, but that one individual makes it all worth, or at least makes it enjoyable. Yeah. Um, uh, not a bad day. Jim and Spam's relationship could have easily stopped there. Two people who met at work and who slowly but surely fall in love and get married. However, real life is not that simple, and thus the relationship cannot be that simple either. Throughout the run of the show, there are several obstacles that often try to keep them apart. When Jim and Pam first met, Pam is with Roy, her high school sweetheart, who she's been engaged with for years. Jim reveals his feelings to Pam, only to be rejected. I'm in love with you. What? Pam breaks up with Roy, but Jim is now there in Karen. I should tell you that I've sort of started seeing someone. And, oh, uh, that's totally cool. You can do whatever you want. Pam goes back with Roy, but he later breaks up with her after finding out what happened between her and Jim. This is over. Yeah, you're right. This is so over. You kidding me, Pam? And Jim ultimately breaks up with Karen to finally be with Pam. Hey. Do you still have feelings for her? Yes. We've all been there at one time or another, the one time of your life when you meet who could potentially be the love of your life, only to stumble upon a number of obstacles between you and said person. This can be finding out that person is with someone else, and on top of that, said person is not treated right, or a number of different things. Some people end up together under similar circumstances, and some people don't. But no matter the case, the least you could do is try to become friends, right? As the show moves on and Jim and Pam start dating, we start to see how comfortable they start feeling and acting with each other, and how they are making each other grow and become a better person. Jim brings the quirky and creative side of Pam out, well that was completely ignored and withdrawn by Roy. There's this internship in graphic design that Jan was telling us about. She made it sound like really great. Nice. Well, what's it all about? Um, I think you should do it. <laughs> That's great. It's really cool. And Pam makes Jim take his job and his life a little bit more serious than before, as he starts taking more initiative at work and looks after the well-being of Pam and their marriage in a number of ways. Hey, Ryan, it's Jim. Look, man, I don't know what's gotten into you lately, but you know what? I really don't care because you're trying to get rid of me, and I bet you think I don't care enough about this job to actually fight back, but you're wrong because I do and I will. So you can keep trying to push me out of this place, but guess what? I'm not going anywhere. They start living a healthy relationship. And even in harder and more complicated occasions, such as when Jim is manager and therefore Pam's boss, they're able to handle it pretty well. However, it is around season 7 that the audience begins perceiving that things have started to change. The earliest instance that I can find of this is during season 7, episode 7, where Jim and Pam have not eaten anything and they have a meaningless argument that they easily brush off. And I say meaningless since it's pretty obvious that they're angry for nothing other than because they are hungry. Oh, you think she is jealous about having a baby? I don't know, I'm just hungry. Okay, well, you know what? Everybody's hungry. Sorry, I think I'm just hungry. However, this marks an instance of something that up to that point the audience had not been exposed to and that will not happen again until season 8. Minor arguments that are easily ignored or fixed. The amazing part of this change is that it seems incredibly organic and completely real as they have a child now and the toll that this takes on them is noticeable for their lack of sleep and the increased amount of stress that they now show. Just burp her. I don't want her to spit up on you. 
look at you. Come here, sweetie. Oh my god. What? Wrong baby. What? what? Wrong baby. This is not our baby. It is at the end of season 7 that Michael Scott leaves, and this opens the door to have a little bit more insight into the life of each of the characters, including Jim and Pam. From season 8 on, the audience is now exposed to more serious and impactful arguments of Jim and Pam that show issues that are very much real and that affect most, if not all, long-term romantic relationships. Jealousy over other co-workers, such as when Pam spends about half of season 8 jealous of the new girl, Kathy, and to be fair, for good reason, as we find out that Kathy actually does have other intentions. Expenses paid. Yeah, Jim's gonna be there. Marriage is not good. Nobody knows better than me. Definitely we will. It's three weeks in Tallahassee, what else is there to do? Lying and or poor financial decisions behind each other's back, like when Jim decided to invest in a new company without asking Pam for import or opinion. I can do the full 10,000, we should just all in. All right, welcome aboard. All right. Awesome, cool. Failing to show up to important locations due to work meetings, or overall putting work over your significant other's well-being and happiness and all the problems that come with this. It's gone. That moment's just gone. I missed it. I don't know. Jim, maybe you should have been there. You're not serious, right? These are all very real and very relatable issues for long-term couples. In my own experience, I often find that as my friends and I grow older, we seem to like and understand the relationship a whole lot more. Not only this, but the extreme popularity of the show also talks on how viewerships keep finding the show more relatable and real than most shows as time goes on and more people watch it. Despite how the show began to decline in quality after season 7, I always found it interesting how the relationship almost reached a full circle. The writers of the show play around with the idea of taking it up a notch in realism and splitting Jim and Pam up as early as season 5. This idea almost came to fruition with the introduction of one of the documentary crew members in Season 9, Brian, and the almost heroic and noble role that he began playing in Pam's life. I'm getting tougher. I just don't know that it's gonna be this hard. Yeah. Let's turn the key. With this came the intention of presenting to the audience the possibility of Pam having an affair with Brian, mostly due to her ongoing predicaments with Jim. And I find it interesting as they were once again pulling the relatable card, as divorce rates in the United States are incredibly high, between 40 and 50% depending on where you look. Of course, this idea never actually led to anything, as it completely backfired on them after season 9 episode 14 where Brian defends Pam from Frank. The critique they received for this episode made them realize how painful this will be for the audience. Well, last of My truck? You had no right! You know, you had no rights. It's a $40,000 truck. So? You started it. So? So someone needs to shut you hey, up. Hey, hey, hey! Ah. Whoa. Easy. Son of a Instead, Jim has a wake-up call and changes for the better, realizing what he was doing and choosing Pam over everything else once again, regardless of how much success and money that could potentially bring to him. Not enough for me. You are everything. The show ends with Pam realizing the huge sacrifice that Jim is making for the sake of her happiness and their family and getting completely on board with what Jim had planned in the beginning, trying to sell their current home so that they can move to Philly and start over with this new opportunity and happily working towards making their marriage better instead of just letting it go. It is idealistic, yes, but it's completely reasonable and it falls entirely within the possibilities of their marriage and the love that they have shown one another throughout the years. Having a soulmate who you inevitably end up with no matter the time and life paths may seem extremely romantic. A blue French horn may symbolize undying love, although not really because it doesn't make sense at all. And teenage love that goes on forever is very romanticized and an idea that we all play in our heads at one point. But Jim and Pam take it one step further. Love cannot always be shown in extreme romantic gestures, on platonic love that is meant to be, or whatever this is. Blocks out so much noise, they could sell out of bows. Ugh, this has got to end. It's not just dead. That was the last time. But it's always nurtured and taken care of in the mundane and almost monotone moments of the relationship. It is showed in the jokes that grow between the two over time, the nurture and support of each other's dreams, the sacrifice and commitments, and of course, big romantic acts, you know, whenever it's possible. An extreme romantic relationship can be good and entertaining in the moment, 
but realism is timeless, and no matter when you watch it, you'll always be able to see your reflection in it. And in the end, that's the art of Jim and Pam's relationship. The perfect archetype of a TV couple. When you're a kid, you assume your parents are soulmates. My kids are going to be right about that. Thank you for watching today's video guys. Before this video ends however, I wanted to say a little thank you to my fellow content creator Jesse Trivels. He gave me a ton of useful advice for this video and a lot of guidance and without him this video would not be possible. If you like video essays make sure that you check out his channel. He has a ton, a ton of video essays and this video actually got inspired by one he has on The Office. So please make sure that you go check out his channel. Jesse, once again, thank you so much and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you, bye bye.